good kitten in today. He's been a very playful kitten today, if I do say so myself. And welcome to the start of my Wild Arms 2 series. I've been working quite a bit behind the scenes to try to make this as not just seamless as possible, but also as high quality as possible. You'll notice, for instance, that I'm actually recording this at 1440p rather than 720p or 1080p. Not only 1440p, but also at 60 frames a second. The reason for that is that I'm going to be using some very, very heavy upscaling. And 1440p is an integer scale of 240p. So we don't have weird partial pixel barrier type things going on. And it will end up making the experience look quite a bit better. This is a much higher quality experience than what the base Wild Arms 2 would normally have. But due to, um, it's not technically RetroArch doing it, it is actually, um, Beetle PSX, the emulator core that I'm using inside of RetroArch, increasing the internal upscaler, or not upscaler, it's increasing the internal rendering resolution quite a bit higher than what it was in the PlayStation 1. PlayStation runs, run, one, ah, runs at 240p for Wild Arms 2, I'm running this at 1440p, and I'm running the internal scaler at 1440p. So this is going to be a substantially higher quality experience. The downside is that the text will be a little bit blurrier, but it's still perfectly readable, and I'm going to be reading all the text out loud anyway, so hopefully it won't be too bad. I do have captions. Unfortunately, I was not able to actually get my captions to display properly. Um, if anybody has any suggestions on that, since I do have all of the captions, it's just that it will record quite a bit of the captions like on subsequent lines for absolutely no reason and try to display all of it at the same time. So the captioning is not so great, but the fact that I'm recording it means I can go back and actually add in captions as I see fit. Uh, what else? I have Maya here. So we will have our mascot for Wild Arms if one of my kitties does not want to cooperate, like he's currently crying at the sunning glass door. Flying glass door is open, so I don't even know why he's crying. Uh, what else? Um, as I've mentioned in a previously recorded video, these will be uploaded and public Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I'm going to try to not get more than a week ahead, but it might be as much as two weeks ahead, depending on if I think there's going to be a particularly busy week or something. Uh, which means that I am going to have to constantly record these on the weekend. Luckily, I'm only recording about three hours at a time, so it's not too bad. And that does mean that there will be some delays in response if somebody has questions that I want to bring up in the video. Having said that, that's actually less of a delay than I had with Wild Arms 1, so probably okay there. Uh, what else before I start explaining Wild Arms 2? Hmm... Well, I guess that's it, so it's time to start explaining. So, Wild Arms 2 is the second in the, I wouldn't say critically acclaimed Wild Arms series, but a relatively popular um, PlayStation 1 era RPG Wild Arms series. Um, you may have seen my Wild Arms 1 videos. If not, I'll have a link in the description to the playlist that has my entire Let's Play of them, where I also analyze a bunch of the mechanics of the game and generally just show off <laughs> and have fun, because Wild Arms 1 is one of my favorite games. It is my favorite PlayStation 1 RPG. And the Wild Arms series is my favorite JRPG series. Um, what I mean by JRPG is that this is an RPG from Japan. And not only is it an RPG from Japan, it is a turn-based RPG. Uh, these are the styles of RPGs that I tend to prefer. And if you picture any of the classic Final Fantasy games where you have a row of people up on one side, and then you also have a row of enemies on the other side. That's what I'm referring to by a classic JRPG. Wild Arms 2 still fits the formula of classic JRPG. They have greatly increased the graphical fidelity. Um, it's still So Wild Arms 1 was an early PlayStation RPG. So you had sprite-based graphics, which, to be honest, I actually prefer the older style PlayStation 1 RPGs, but that's fine. Um, so you had older sprite-based graphics, the 3D was very rudimentary, 
um, you couldn't really make out much of anything. Turns out if I would have used the same upscaler I'm going to be using today, I would have actually been able to look at a balloon's face, which is fascinating to me. Wild Arms 2, on the other hand, in Japan was released in 1999, so we're talking about toward the end of the PlayStation 1 era rather than the beginning of the PlayStation 1 era, and it shows. Um, the environment is 3D rather than 2D, which means that the upscaler is going to have its work cut out for it because now I'm actually going to be upscaling every 3D object. Um, the game itself is still using a lot of sprites, so we're still going to see sprites. It's fine. Um, but we're no longer at a fixed overhead angle. We can actually rotate the camera around. Unfortunately, because it's at the end of the PlayStation 1 era and they did all of these 3D things, the frame rate of the game is... Ah... Uh... Variable. Uh, in certain dungeons, it drops below 10 and below 5 in some battles. Uh, so we may be making judicious use, judicious use of the fast-forward keys. Just because, um, yeah, I would like to not have this take forever. This is already going to take several months. Also, Isun is crying for absolutely no reason again. Because I don't know why. One moment. So... Wild Arms 2 is... I apparently hit a button on my phone. That's not what Wild Arms 2 is about. Wild Arms 2 is similar to Wild Arms 1, is that it is a western-tinged RPG. So each of the Wild Arms series, as far as I'm concerned, is western combined with some other... Uh, not quite genre, but setting. Setting's the right word. Uh, Wild Arms 2 is western combined with modern. So we're going to have a bit of mix of technologies, even more so than Wild Arms 1, which, spoiler alert, Wild Arms 1 is not quite a medieval fantasy RPG. Uh, Wild Arms 2 is, in fact, not quite a Wild West RPG either, although very thematically Wild West. There are six characters in the game, three quote-unquote main characters, one of which is absolutely the main character. Unlike Wild Arms 1, it's not really up for debate as to who the actual main character of the game is. In Wild Arms 2, it is absolutely Ashley, um, which we'll be introducing momentarily. What else? Um, so yeah, there's six characters, two of which are... No, one of which is a hidden optional character, although hidden is a strong term. It's... I don't know of anybody who's played through the game that did not encounter the character and had them join the party. I know lots of people who didn't actually end up playing the character because, and this is where I start announcing where I'm going to make this run a little different, um, Wild Arms 2 has is the first entry of the series that uses what's called the personal skill system. Um, as you level up, you'll get personal skills points that you can assign into various categories, which make your characters a bit more unique. Um, and I'll explain this in much more detail when we actually get to the personal skills section, but this is something that I wanted to explain in advance, because it's going to look a little weird the way I'm doing this. One of the personal skills is up HP, which increases the amount of HP you get per level. It's not retroactive. Which is a major problem, because not all of your characters you gain at level 1. In fact, Every character in the game, with the exception of Lilka and Brad, who you start with, uh, will start at the same level as Ashley. As a result, I am going to be trying to keep Ashley as low of a level as possible, because what ends up happening in a normal Wild Arms 2 run is that you end up gaining... Uh, well, nope, all of them are spoilers, so you end up gaining spoiler number one. And the first character that you gain past the initial three, Ashley might be in the low 20s on level. That's not too bad. The other two characters, Ashley might end up being in the 40s or 50s on level, so you've lost 40 to 50 levels of an increased hit points. And it's not a small amount of hit points that it increases either. It's a very substantial amount, especially for some of those characters that wouldn't get too many hit points normally, like a caster, for instance. So those characters end up being woefully far behind in a game that the bosses like to hit you for gobs and gobs of hit points. So you don't end up using them. I am trying to use those last two characters in particular this run. So I'm going to be keeping Ashley at a very low level. Which means 
that you won't be seeing the full power of MMPA, which I will explain what that acronym is when it's no longer a spoiler. And you will also notice that Ashley is going to be a heck of a lot weaker of a character than normal. Normally, Ashley is an extremely overpowered character. Possibly one of the most overpowered characters in any RPG that I've ever played. Um, and that includes Peter from Shining Force 2, even. So, that's going to be a little different. I just wanted to give you a heads up. Uh, there is, on GameFAQs, there is a walkthrough for a sane method of doing a low-level run. I'm not quite following the walkthrough step by step, but I am going to be doing a lot of the same things that the walkthrough is doing. Just so I can keep Ashley at a low enough level when other characters join that they'll get their proper amount of hit points. I'm not going to be super religious about this, but wanted to give you a heads up. Also, one last thing. Content warning. Wild Arms 2 contains elements of extreme violence, genocide, nuclear warfare, torture, crucifixion, off-screen rape, and off-screen incest. Viewers, please be advised that this run is not necessarily going to be six-year-old kid-friendly. Oh, yeah. Um, what was the game rated? Uh... Uh, it's not on that one. One moment. Let me grab the, the, uh, CD. Here it is. E for everyone. What the heck? Welcome to Wild Arms 2. There we go. Welcome to Wild Arms 2. Notice, I'm not pressing any buttons. No intro. That's because the intro to the game is actually when you load the game. Uh, so, you'll notice above me that I have the two different styles of cover art. The top one, way up there, is the Japanese version. This is the American version. Um, I'm actually going to be using the American version primarily for this game. Mostly because there's very little difference between the two types of cover art. Uh, which is nice for once. Um, let's go ahead and switch that. Oh yeah, there's no extra sequence or anything like that, but sitting here on the opening. So again, Wild Arms 2 was released in 1999 in Japan and 2000 in the United States. So, what, PS2 came out in 2001? We're not exactly talking about too many... And there's not much else beyond Wild Arms 2 for JRPGs. Um, let's go ahead and go. turn on our kitty cam, of which right now only Maya's sitting there because Isun is being a butt. Uh, he's he's already knocked over my green screen once during this, just to give you an idea of how much of a butt he's been. <sighs> he just wants attention and love. So, let's go ahead and start. How's it going? This loading screen should look awfully familiar. I have things a little crop, don't I? One moment. I guess it actually is cropped like that, isn't it? Huh, okay. I should move over a little bit. There we go. So, um, we are going to be starting a new game. And I am going to be speaking through the opening sequence. And there's reason for that, because then Sony doesn't flag me with a copyright flag. So, there are no vocals for the American version. But, this is the disc one opening. Disc one. I know it's mirror image right now. Editor me will have to go back through and label things if I feel like it. There might be some spoilers in here, actually. So, there is actually a significant difference between the Japanese and American openings this time. So, this is the American opening is actually basically a cover of the Japanese opening. 
and I'll link to the actual openings in the description. That way I don't have to get copyright flags. I may end up just recording it myself. That is Ashley, for reference. That is Brad. That's Lilka. That's Tim with Puka. Saw a brief another character. That is Canon. That is Anastasia. That is Irving. That's Ashley some more. That is Marina. And all of these are either playable characters or major NPCs, I should say. So, um, the reason why I say that the American version is actually a cover of the Japanese version is that the Japanese version has vocals. Um, again, I'll be putting links in the description. Uh, I'll even include a link to a much more recent version of the opening that was played. Uh, that was actually played by um, their... So the composer of Wild Arms 2 is the same as the composer of Wild Arms 1, which is uh, Michigan Naroke. I'm probably saying that wrong as usual. Um, mispronouncing Japanese things is my thing. Um, however, the vocalist for the Wild Arms series is Kaoriaso. And they decided during the pandemic to get the band back together and have a pandemic concert. And the very first thing that they recorded was that opening. However, they obviously did the Japanese version of the opening, which actually has vocals. Um, which means that you get to see a bunch of different webcams of people playing the music, including Michiko Naroke, who's on piano and has a handpan figurine that I totally want. Holy crap, I want it. I want it. I want it. Anyway. Um, so, as I keep showing, this is the American version of the game. This is the Japanese version of the game. You can even see my reflection in front of the monitor. Um, I do, in fact, own both versions. I, the Japanese version only arrived earlier this past week, which is great timing. So I can actually record the Japanese opening intro if I want to. So we have our character selection screen. This is very similar to the opening of Wild Arms. Keep moving around and gesturing and covering up the key cam. I need to get used to the setup again. So very similar to Wild Arms 1, we get to choose between the three characters whose paths will eventually move together. We've got a young man ready for action, a former hero, but now war criminal, and we have a sorceress just getting started. I'm going to start with a sorceress just getting started, and I have a very good reason for this. Also need to remember that this does not conform to normal controller standards. So you'll notice how crisp some of the um, textures in the background look. That's from the upscaler. Um, I can put a link into the description for a brief video test that I did that compared like using RetroArch at regular normal upscaling settings um, for 1080p, using RetroArch with this method and using my um, what you call it? Um, XRGB Frame Meister, and having a hardware upscaler on an actual PlayStation One, and the difference is dramatic. Well, what about our payment? You ought to know. You ought to be more worried about a Merc who works for free. Ha <laughs> ha! You got that right. <laughs> what are you laughing about, you old geezer? Oh, I should warn you. The translation of this game not very good. Um, Wild Arms 1 had a better translation, and I even complained about the translation there. This game's worse. Much worse. Let's stay on the subject, okay? We must plan a counterattack. Huh. Wish someone would do something. Kink. Sorry, sorry, sorry for being so late. I haven't quite gotten the act of this teleport gem. For a minute, I thought I had teleported the wrong place again. Uh-oh. Uh this isn't the Valeria household, is it? I knew it. Excuse me, but... 
Who are you exactly? This is Lilka. Lilka is one of our characters. Lilka is basically the equivalent of Cecilia in Wild Arms 1. You're going to notice I'm going to do a lot of comparison to Wild Arms 1, but Wild Arms 2 does not require any background knowledge of Wild Arms 1. All there are references to things, and the references are very minor ones at that. You can play through, you can start Wild Arms 2 without ever having to play Wild Arms 1, and you won't miss a thing. Except for some background stuff, which I'll be explaining in this run. Um, Wild Arms 3 is actually the one that has much more... Much more than just references to the previous Wild Arms games. Anyway, as usual, I'm going to be sticking with the basic character names, or the start default character names. So this is Luka. This is Luka Ilniak. Ilniak? Iniak? At least they came to a place where everyone seems so nice. I know I should hurry, but I guess there's no harm in resting here for a little while. What's weird is, well, they dump that stuff on rice to eat it. That's just so gross. Right? So, Lilka is 14, if I remember correctly. So, remember when um, in Wild Arms 1, um, Cecilia was a different age, depending on whether you're in the Japanese or American version of the game? Uh, in this game, Lilka, I believe, is always 13 or 14. So, she's a young teenager. Man, these graphics look so good compared to my memory. Normally when I play these retro games, I have to realize that I have a nostalgia filter over everything. I'm not expecting the graphics to look as good as what my memory tells me. This is the opposite. The graphics look better than my memory. So this is going to throw me off quite a bit. Try this nice warm treat. Mm. There. Do you feel better now? Sorry about the way I acted. I was just so nervous. I just can't get the hang of the teleport gem, you know? An item used for moving around. I'm studying magic, and this one item just seems to have it in for me or something. Oh, you know how to use magic? Uh, actually, I'm still learning. Wow, oh, I'm so impressed. Glug, glug, glug. Yeah, to give you an idea, you can't see their eyeballs correctly in the normal Wild Arms 2. <laughs> oh, don't be impressed. Anyone can use magic, you know. You mean, even I can learn magic? Of course you can. For instance, you can pick out a loved one's voice or your own name in a noisy room. It's a kind of magic, too. Get it? No, I don't get it. No? Oh, um... But you will someday. Magic is a power that anyone can use. And magic can do anything. Flashback time. Oh, sis, what am I supposed to do? I don't know what to do. I can't figure it out all alone. Calm down. It'll be okay. Hey, don't cry. Can you see the big switch bolt behind you? Use your magic on it. It'll be alright. I know you can do it. I can't do it. I won't lie or say anything. I'm not good at you good at it like you are, sis. Didn't you fail to control the gate because you didn't do it right, sis? Try starting over. This time the door should open. Open! Come on, open up! This time I'll show you a different method. It'll be fine. This way is easy. So why didn't you show me this from the start? Well, see the small switch block just below where you are. 
Use the same method to get your magic to work. Hey sis, look, it worked this time. There are sweet three switch blocks left. We need to get at all of them. Leave the rest to me. I can manage this. Let's review how to handle a fire rod. If you press square, your magic turns into a flame and you can fire in front of you. Are you okay, Loka? I know, I'm fine. This is a piece of cake. We have control now, but did you notice something? We just passed Bechdel. This is the tutorial of the game. Remember in Wild Arms 1, where we didn't pass Bechdel the entire game? In this game, we passed it right at the opening with absolutely no issues whatsoever. Told you, they learned quite a bit as they were making these Wild Arms games. So, I have control at this point. Oops, as I fast forward by accident. Oops, I just moved off. When you come to the edge of a floor above a drop, your character makes can make the oops action. In the oops state, you can press the X button to go ahead and jump down. You can also jump down by dashing off a edge without the oops action. So one thing I should note is that this game actually supports digital controls, unlike the original Wild Arms. Second thing, we have camera rotation. So this is what's called the Millennium Puzzle. We're actually going to be hitting, and uh, Wild Arms 2 and 3 have Millennium Puzzles. I don't know about 4 and beyond. Um, ah. Sorry, I'm getting used to the game again. I did not play this game ahead of time at all. Luca. What is it, sis? Oh, nothing. Never mind. Be careful. So, Millennium Puzzle is our introduction dungeon. This unusual object is called a save point. It records your adventure. This amazing stone has the power to save your adventure to a memory card. What do you want to do? Save points. All right. Yes, let's continue. Unfortunately, using right and... Uh, the right and left buttons to rotate the camera is unintuitive to me now because I've gotten too used to just using analog stick to rotate the camera. So it's gonna take me a bit to get used to. Right? That's what that does. See, puzzle. I'm half tempted to actually react the buttons so I don't have to deal with that. Because it makes trying to figure out the 3D difficult. At least to me. Alright. I can go three different ways. Let's go this way. Pick up the gems, the faintly sparkling jewels of life, to restore lost hit points. Gems heal all the members of your party, but the amount of HP restored depends on the size of the gem. So these tiny gems restore 1% of your maximum hit points. For reference, we have 60 hit points, so 1% isn't much. Speaking of, I should probably explain the menu, because over on the left you'll see character stuff, and you will notice something very, very fast. No MP. Wild Arms 1 is the only entry of the Wild Arms series that has MP. I don't even think XF had MP, but I'm, I can't remember off the top of my head. Instead, we have Force Points. For those of you that may not have looked at my Wild Arms 1 video and, or have never paid attention to it, Force Points are things that you gain during combat that the more that you get hit or attack or anything like that, you build up Force and you're able to execute powerful attacks. In this case, you can do more than just execute powerful attacks. You can actually, you use Force Points as though it's MP 
Sort of. And I will explain more of that when we actually get into a combat, which we're going to be running away from a lot of combats right in the beginning. Just as a heads up, I'm not going to be fighting in this place at all. Alright, our items. We have ten heal berries and three gimel coins. Gimel coins are used as continues. Yes, we actually have continues in this game now, on top of the save points. Um, we start with a mumbrella, as in, I'm assuming this is the umbrella that my mother gave me. Uh, we have no gear equipped. We have a breeze cape and a hairband equipped, and nothing else. And yes, guard stands for guardian. We are a crest sorceress, which is the same class that uh, Cecilia was in Wild Arms 1. We have auto battle settings. These auto battle settings are the simp a more simplified version of what they were in Wild Arms 1, which is you have manual, normal, and balanced, because that's really all that anybody ever used in Wild Arms 1. We have formation. So you can actually change places not just up and down, but it looks like left to right. You can only have three characters in combat at a time, but um, you can actually switch them during combat. So if, say, for instance, you have three characters and Lil Lilka's KO'd, you can actually swap Lilka with somebody else, and you still have three characters fighting. That will become very important for this low-level run soon enough. And status, just to get an idea as to what they are. All of their stats. This time it actually tells you what the stats actually mean, which is what I was trying to look up in Star Wars 1 before, but I could never remember a response. Um, yeah. We only have one character, so there's not really much else there. And we have one tool, which is the rod. Yep, we can actually change things from here. But the problem is that we can't, like, change that much. Sound? We've got stereo and mono. We have a compass that we can activate or deactivate. Motion view is for the combat, or the battle camera, if I remember correctly. Battle command, once more, we have neutral or fixed. Uh, this is the same as Wild Arms 1, where by default, in combat, you have to hold down a button to choose your action rather than just moving up. Cursor location, once more, it'll remember where you, uh, you return to the start versus remembering where you last were. Same as Wild Arms 1. Same with the screen location, you can adjust your screen. We have a screensaver, which we will in fact enable in this case, because I want to. We can change the window design to four different types, or make our own custom. And once more, we can change icon designs, only instead of being able to customize them, we are instead just changing what the buttons look like. Uh, in this case, I actually prefer Type E, just because I like rounded icons. Alright, why is my tablet making a bunch of noise? That is abnormal that it's making this much noise. Uh, one moment. Why did it make noise? Whatever. Probably a weather update or something. Alright. We've played for 14 minutes. Although this recording's been for 33. be able to tell the difference if I had rotated. Yep. So yep, this is just a standard puzzle. This is just for so you get used to the game. And honestly, starting as Lilka makes the most sense in my mind just from a tutorial standpoint. This shows that yes, diagonals are a thing. So we can attack blue books. Remember blue books? Yeah, we're running away, by the way. So, we failed to escape. That's fine. We're just gonna take a hit from a blue book. Casting break on us.
Oh yeah, I should mention, now that we've gained force points, we have enough to be able to cast our spells. We have flame, freeze, and heal. It's very similar to Wild Arms 1. Oh, come on! There we go. We're running away because we don't want to level up before we get the ability to spend our personal skills. Um, level 1, we don't have any personal skills, so that part doesn't actually make a difference. See? We gained back some of our hit points. Um, yeah. So, again, we don't have any personal skills right now, so it doesn't make a huge difference. Ah, there it is. Not that there's anything up here, but I felt like it. Um, yeah, we're not going to be doing a whole bunch in the way of combat for a while. So for each of the three starting tutorial scenarios, what we're going to end up doing is just fighting the boss and nothing else. There we go. We hit one of the blocks. Now we need to do the other two. I intend to just finish this tutorial and not much else for reference. Sis, what happens when I get it to respond? When all the switch blocks respond, the partially opened gate gets reset. I can manage that even with my level of magic skills. Right. Good luck, Loka. Two switch blocks remain. So Loka's sister never technically gets named in this game? But she is absolutely a major character. Ah, that's what that one did. So, combat system is a little different, although we're not going to see that initially. That way. And the gym this way. Once more, we're in the beginning of the game. Don't expect a bunch of, like, um... Words are hard. Um, don't expect a whole bunch of non-linearity. So I should probably explain the exclamation points. What are you, anyway? A bogey. Oh, that sounds like something we need to run away from. Um, the red exclamation point means that there's a battle that you can't do anything about. But there's also white exclamation points and green exclamation points. White exclamation points you can cancel out, and you can decide... Ah, uh, dang it. Should have been paying attention to the ground. Red exclamation points indicate that it's an enemy that's a higher level than your micro level. I think that's the term in Wild Arms 2. It's the term in Wild Arms 3 because Wild Arms 3 uses a very similar concept, but... I just went around by accident, didn't I? Yep. I had already gone through here. Whoops. That's what I get for not paying attention. Oh wait, no! That actually was what I needed to do. Alright! Only one switch block left! You did really well. I'm the little sister of the one called the Ilniac Witch Girl. So it is Ilniac and not Ilniac. So, um, look at Ilniac, and her sister is the Ilniac Witch Girl. This was nothing. I'm me and you are you. We're different. You need to believe in yourself. Loka, from now on, you need to believe in the magic that is yours alone. No matter how hard things get, 
You'll always be able to overcome it with your magic. Huh? What? Finding vaults now? Later. I'll leave it to later. If I can do things with my magic, I'll listen to anything. This is another one of those, I think the translation's off. Because that did not really make all that much sense. Especially what I know about the rest of the game. because I am level one and everything is unavoidable. What are you? A gom. Again, I'm running away from everything until the boss because I kinda have to. I mean, have to is a strong term, but I want to. Oops. Trying to, I keep trying to do that. So yeah, Fire Rod's my only tool right now. So I don't have a Crest Rod. I, or what was it? Oh, that's right. It was the Teardrop that uh, Cecilia started with. When in doubt, check everything. I mean, this is just a tutorial dungeon. There's not really any items here to speak of. Uh, am I full on hit points now? Yeah. I should probably leave those crystals behind as much as possible. Aha! One. The other one of those was three, I believe. Yeah, I hope you didn't want to see anything of the combat system of the first video. You're not really going to see much of it. One, three. I think I need to check the other two to see their heights. That was four. One, three, four. I'm gonna guess the other one's two. No! I'm gonna get beaten up by a bunch of bugs. Wow, the character models are so much more um there than I remember. Even if I can see a little bit of checkerboarding due to the um uh dithering that's required for the original PS1 game. There's a lot of checkerboarding, but honestly, this still looks way better than the other ways that I've gotten this. Actually, I did get hit, so I'll go ahead and take those. Let's hit the last one, even though I bet it's two. How am I doing on hit points? Yeah, I'll go ahead and take these. Yep, it's two. Ah. Did not mean to fall, although that would actually be faster. Slowly remembering how to play. I mean, it's been a long time. I've only beaten this game twice for reference, and the last time I beat it would have been in 2001. I have not played it on anything other than my original PlayStation 1. And I haven't done that. Well, it was 2001, that'd be 19 years ago. Uh, for reference, today is September 5th, 2020. All right, so this is one, not ah, one, damn it, let's reset. Oops. Damn it. <sighs> this is just me being controlled. One, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four. Done. Oh, it was three. Whoops. 
It worked. That's all that matters. Where are you, sis? I can't leave the gate of the Millennium Puzzle like this. Soon, you'll be linked to the world you came from, so don't worry. Sis, you... Say... Promise... I... To... Loka... Can't hear you, sis! Sis? Achievement unlocked. Millennium Puzzle. Oh, you can't see the achievements. Hmm. That might be a problem. So I actually have achievements enabled. Uh, there's a plugin for RetroArch that allows you to link in with retroachievements.org. And this game has achievements, so I decided to do it. You can do anything with magic if you use it right. Father! Oh, darling. What's the matter? Did you come up with a plan? No, we're stumped. Go figure, eh? I'm sorry, you seem to be bothered by something. I can help if you want. Can you tell me what's wrong? Oh, well, for the past few days, our peaceful, humble village has been attacked nightly by monsters. The villagers have not been harmed, but they live in fear of the night. Tonight's meeting was to discuss this monster problem. Let me help, please! girl like you do. Daddy, she knows how to cast magic spells! Just leave everything to me. Your troubles are over. You mean they've just begun? No! <sighs> Alright, I have actually I actually have control over Loka now. The Mercs are adventurers who un explore ancient ruins and hunt monsters for bounty. They'd be perfect for a job like this. Go upstairs, see what's upstairs. Those scary monsters will only attack the wheat field only attack the wheat fields. At least no one in the village has been harmed so far, but my dad's out patrolling to make sure those monsters don't try anything. I see a little book entitled Trail of the Comet. Do you want to read it? Cleaving through the stars is a comet with its long tail. But do you know the difference between a comet and a meteor? A meteor is a meteoroid that is drawn by gravity into the atmosphere. A comet, unlike a star, travels in a fixed orbit and appears at regular intervals. Steeped in mystery, comets have inspired many folk tales. Some superstitions claim to be claim comets to be bad omens, but no one knows why. Once more, this is a sign that technology is a little further advanced than it was in Wild Arms 1. I mean, yes, they're using um, fire-based candelabra still. But, they know the world's round. To be fair, most people in medieval times did. That's just a trope. But, more importantly, they know that comets being seen as ill omens are superstitions. It's not just a comets are supersti- er, comets are signs of ill omens. And they know the difference between a comet and a meteorite. And they also know what orbits are. Right. In the village. I can store records of your adventure on a memory card. This is the memory service. We'll actually find out more information about this later because this game explains why save points exist. <laughs> Which, yes, yes, please. We're at 49 minutes. Hmm. We can go a little bit longer, I think. So we're in Palace Village. door is locked. We can't do much here right now. We're actually going to be able to do more here later on in the game. Because all the doors are locked. You'll also notice that houses aren't actually necessarily on a normal coordinate system. Like, for instance, this house is north, this house is northeast. We have diagonals. It's a weak, 
It was about, yes, exactly a week ago that the village was first attacked. I remember it well because we were busy harvesting the palace wheat. Yeah, the easy trees are a little more obvious in this version of the game, but I could tell even on the original. Can't jump, though, so we can't go up there. This is the end. The door's locked. We finished, har we finished harvesting the all-important wheat that the village economy depends on. Granary is chock full of wheat we harvested. So many shops, we can't enter any of them. It's come from the northeast. The northeast is an unlucky direction. Bad things always come from the northeast. And guess where the granary in the village is? Right, northeast part of town. Okay, let's sum up what we know, all right? The monsters aren't after the village or the villagers, they're after the wheat harvest. No one has been hurt, the damage is limited to the wheat in the wheat field. Come to think of it, the monsters always appear in the northeast. They're back! The monsters! The monsters are attacking! They're after the granary! Hurry! Don't panic, just find somewhere safe to hide. Or someplace safe to hide. I'll take care of the monsters. My magic. Lady, give me a hand. This is something that we have for every boss. Boundless Glutton Monster Oliver. Every boss is introduced this way. Boss monsters can be attacked both at the body and the limbs. The body bears its name. The bon boss monster is defeated when the body HP reaches zero. When a limb drops to zero HP, the boss is not defeated, but you are an experience in Gela. So, normally what you want to do is defeat all of the parts of a boss. Note that I can't cast any magic right now because my force isn't high enough. You want to defeat all of the parts of the boss before you defeat the boss itself. We're not doing that. Also, I love how I can see a comet, like, Star, shooting stars type of thing because I never saw that in the actual PlayStation uh, on the actual PlayStation using a crappy CRT going through a VCR um, we're not we're intentionally going to be avoiding doing that initially because yes we would gain a little bit of extra XP and if I remember right there's an achievement for it but we're trying to minimize the amount of XP that we get until we have the ability to register some personal skills if we just take out Oliver we'll only level up once which is exactly how much XP we want to take so we're going to punch Oliver in the face with our umbrella. Because yes, Lilka really does use it. Is he sneezing at me? 30! Damn! <coughs> um, am I going to survive the first battle? Flame! Yeah, the magic effects are a little better than they were before. 102 in red. Oliver Juice! He took 22. I'm gonna heal. Because I seem to be faster than Oliver, even though I'm level 1. Heal! I healed up the max. I'm getting hit by Oliver Juice again. See that battles are a lot slower than they were in Wild Arms 1. It's because of the frame rate, because it's doing so much more 3D. I mean, look at those models. Admittedly, I have it hella upscaled, but still, look at those models. It's way more detailed than Wild Arms 1. Oliver Juice. That's why I'm going to be judicially using. Fast forward. And by the way, this is the boss battle music. Regular boss battle music. There's a bunch of different music in this game. I'm at force point 100. As per, as that is condition green, which for those of you that may not remember or may not have seen my Wild Arms 1 game, oh, we defeated her, which expanded instead of shrinking. Cool. 650 XP, 250 Gila, we level, level 3, sorry, not level 2 leveling twice, not leveling once. Oh, 
Boundless Glutton Monster Oliver, Achievement Unlocked. Hmm, I wonder if I can throw over those achievements easily. That would be really hard to do now that I think about it. We, we did it! We beat them! Young lady, you drove them off all by yourself? Haha, <laughs> you are amazing, young lady! You're incredible! Wow, your magic is powerful after all. So that was your magic, eh? I said, yeah! Be for victory, sucker! And that is the end of Lilka. For now. Well, not quite. We have the send-off. Wow, you can actually see the little bob interlace, uh, de-interlacing going on, because that was very shimmy, and that was not the case in the original auto CRT. I don't know what we would have, uh, what would have happened if you hadn't come along. Thank you very much. Really? No, thank you. You helped me out so much too. But are you really all right with only this? We can prepare a better reward. Uh, well, I am in a hurry. Even though you probably have use for my magic, that's why I'm so happy to receive the teleport gem. For reference, teleport gems can be bought for like 100 gilla. <laughs> I gained more money from the boss. Big sis, will you ever visit me again? Of course, I promise! I don't even know where I am. And this time, don't mess up! Yeah. Ooh, that was a glitchy effect. We're probably gonna have a few graphical glitches. Ooh, my shoelaces. I wonder if she'll be okay. This has got to be another one of those translation things because um, black hat crossing your path being a sign of bad luck. Lilka in general is viewed as having bad luck. So I think that's what the cat's supposed to indicate rather than, ooh, a kitty, which is my reaction because kitties are awesome. I tried to be cool about it. I might have blown it. I don't think I have have been so cursed if I hadn't accepted a bag lunch. Sorry, that reminds me. Still haven't had breakfast yet. I'm so hungry. Remember, um, Cecilia's running thing was that crest sorceresses eat massive amounts of food? I'm sure it'll be okay. If I get to the Valeria home, I'm sure they'll feed me. Now that that's settled, we are just fine. So there is a, at least that's what I thought. So there is a running theme to Wild Arms 2, just like there's a running theme for Wild Arms 1. But that theme is going to come up a little more in the next video. Hope you've enjoyed this, Internet, and I'll see you, see you next time. Uh, probably with Brad next time. Yeah, Brad. Bye!